Hi guys, today I'm going to be showing you some of the sights from the River Irwell, which flows between the cities of Manchester and Salford. Along with maps, videos and photographs that I've found on the internet, I'll explain some of the history hidden in plain sight along this beautiful river. Manchester, in relation to Europe, is tucked away in the northwest of England and was nicknamed Cottonopolis during the Industrial Revolution. It was also home to the world's first intercity railway, but we'll talk more about that later. The problem with Manchester is that it lies nearly 40 miles from the coast and had to pay heavy taxes to the city of Liverpool for access to the sea for its imports and exports. So in the year 1894 Manchester built a direct link to the Irish Sea with the opening of the world famous Manchester Ship Canal. The navigable canal even made Manchester Britain's third busiest port at one time. So with the use of five locks, seagoing vessels can be lifted 60 feet above sea level into the heart of Manchester. Originally there are eight docks, four in Manchester and four in the neighbouring city of Salford, but a larger ninth dock was added nine years later, in 1905. Slowly ships began to arrive from all over the world. It's hard to imagine looking at the same scene today. However, the canal was not an instant success. You see, to combat the new canal, Liverpool simply lowered their taxes, making the new canal almost completely redundant. To help profitise the canal, in 1898 a new trading system was constructed with the aid of Manchester liners. This shipping company would provide a transatlantic service between the port of Manchester and North America, later expanding to the Mediterranean and it all flowed via the ship canal. Manchester boomed once again. Manchester City Dock System covers an area of 400 acres, including 120 acres of water. The quays have a total length of about five and a half miles. With its own police force and Britain's largest private railway system, the docks look set to be here forever. Soon Manchester liners could be seen in ports all over the world, and far from using second-hand cargo ships, they even started commissioning their own purpose-built vessels. One of their ships, Manchester Division, achieved fame when on her maiden voyage she rammed and sank a German submarine off Flounderer Head in October 1918. The port reached its peak in 1958, with 18 million tonnes being loaded and unloaded that year. A huge effort was made in 1968 to modernise the docks and introduce the world's first containerised dock system. But as time crept on, it became apparent that the ship canal would always have a serious limitation that it could not overcome. The maximum dimensions inflicted on the canal by its seven fixed bridges and five locks. This meant that the canal could only carry ships up to 70 feet tall with a maximum length of 530 feet. Unable to compete with the much larger ships like the ones we see in ports today, Manchester liners were forced to cease trading in 1985. Despite all the hard work to resurrect the docks, the end was nigh and the last container ship left Manchester in 1982. With the decline of the docks, the redundant land was purchased by the council in 1984. The first landmark building to rise from the industrial ashes was the Lowry Theatre, named after L.S. Lowry, Manchester's most famous artist. It was opened in the year 2000 and was the project that brought the keys into the 21st century. More recently, Media City opened here, bringing with it major television companies, sparking a new phase of redevelopment for the keys. Now I've told you a short history of the docks, we'll set off towards the River Irwell. In the dock basin I noticed these strange plumes of bubbles on the surface of the water. It turns out when the docks closed, the council noticed the water in the quays turning green and smelling foul. So they installed these machines called Helexas. Helexas oxygenate the water by mixing oxygen and water together, then exhaust the mixture up under pressure therefore creating water rotation in the docks and dramatically reducing the stagnation in the water. There are around 30 of these improving the water quality around the quays.
In the distance we can see the north and east stand of Old Trafford Football Stadium, home of the world famous team Manchester United. The stadium held its first match in 1910 against Liverpool. Sadly they lost 3-4, but they did go on to become league champions that year. These two steel girders sticking out of the water are here to protect ships from hitting the foundations of the first Trafford Railway Swing Bridge, seen here in this picture in 1934. Built in 1896, it had a total length of 178 feet and had a swinging weight of 250 tonnes. Only the pivot point foundation remains today. The bridge would swing to an island which has also been left in place, but has now been populated by gnomes, hashtag gnome island. During World War II it was felt necessary to replace the single track bridge. The bridge was built by the same company that built the Sydney Harbour Bridge and the Tyne Bridge in Newcastle. It's classed as a Warren Trust bridge and is 80 metres long, 9 metres wide and rises 10 metres above the deck. It weighs 560 tonnes. When the bridge was taken out of service in 1981, it was saved by Salford Council and reclassified by the Port Authority as a vessel so that it could be floated to its new home on the former Dock 9. The structure has been repurposed as a public footbridge and is now fully refurbished in 2005. Big contrast to scenes not so long ago. The layout of the docks was changed significantly by the council. The docks were mostly partitioned off from the canal and the railway bridge was placed in the centre of Dock 9. Small canals were added and the docks renamed after the Great Lakes in North America where Manchester liners once sailed to. The repurposed railway bridge is now known as the Detroit Bridge, much like its namesake city. Heading further up to the end of the ship canal, there's an impressive structure waiting for us. This is Trafford Road Swing Bridge. Trafford Road Swing Bridge is one of seven swing bridges that once spanned the Manchester Ship Canal. It is a bowstring truss bridge built in 1892 and is the largest, heaviest and widest on the Ship Canal. It's 205 feet long, 75 feet wide and weighs 1,800 tonnes. The best bit is the opening and closings were announced by a man blowing a hunting horn. Sadly the bridge was permanently fixed in a closed position in 1998 and a new fixed bridge was built right next to it to ease the road congestion. Around the corner we see the new Metrolink bridges. On the right is the brand new line to the Trafford Centre which opened in 2020. And the line crossing the canal is the Eccles line which opened a full 20 years earlier in the year 2000. The soap works are the redeveloped site of the former Colgate factory. We are now entering the Pomona docks, the very end of the ship canal. This is how they used to look. The ship canal here parallels the Bridgewater canal here and the original dock 5 was here in red. Dock 5 was excavated but never opened and was filled back in in 1905. 
The next to go was all of Dock 1, followed by most of Dock 2, and finally all of Dock 4. Dock 3 was left and a new link to the Bridgewater Canal was constructed, which opened in 1995. This is now known as Pomona Lock. Up these rarely used stairs we find the huge lock gates and as the lock is empty I can open them and show you what it's like inside. The Metrolink crosses the Bridgewater Canal here over bridge number 96. The maximum dimensions for a boat to be able to travel on the waterway are 72 feet long and 14 feet wide. It's kind of nice to see somewhere that isn't covered in graffiti for once. Leaving the former Dock 3, we see the old entrance to Dock 2, which is somewhat filled with sediment and become a safe haven for wildlife. The official end of the Manchester Ship Canal is marked by this beautiful footbridge built in 1873. Woden Street Bridge spans the River Irwell between Aldsall in Salford on the left and St George's Island in Manchester on the right. It's known locally as the Mark Addy Bridge, named after a local hero. Mark Addy is reputed to have rescued over 50 people from the then highly polluted River Irwell during the 19th century. His last rescue was on Whit Monday, 1889, when a boy slipped and fell into the heavily polluted river. A cry for help rang out around the city and without hesitation Mark dived in to rescue him. Although the rescue was successful, Mark died some months later of tuberculosis caused by ingesting some of the polluted river water. On a more personal note about this bridge, my grandfather threw his war medals from it shortly after World War II, but that's a story for another time. 
Watching these geese take off, I spotted this sandstone outcrop, which just so happens to be the very site of Hume Hall. Seen in this drawing, Hume Hall was a manor house dating back to the 12th century, built on the sandstone outcrop. What's interesting though is there is rumoured to be a hidden hoard of treasure somewhere in the grounds of the house, hidden away by Lady Dowger. Unfortunately, over time she was struck down with an illness that rendered her motionless and speechless, before she could disclose the location to her son Thomas Presswich. Thomas passed away relatively penniless, and the hall fell into a state of dilapidation, even becoming a squat residence for some of the city's down and outs. Eventually the hall was sold to the Duke of Bridgewater who knocked most of it down to make way for his canal. But the story doesn't end there. Over the years a number of Manchester fortune tellers have cheated people out of their money claiming to know where the secret treasure is buried. But to this day the treasure has never been found. I wish I could find it, I know that much. Now we are at the corner of Victoria Quay and the entrance to the River Medlock. Here we see the River Irwell and now the River Medlock and finally the Bridgewater Canal all connected up. We are here and we're about to look here which is the site of Hume Lock, the original connection for boats between the Irwell and the Bridgewater. Three locks were built in 1839 so that boats could travel between Irwell and the Bridgewater Canal. However, to speed up the process, in 1962, the third lock was modified so that the two locks at the top were no longer required. Here's a photograph of the Duke's Barge Parderry leaving the modified lock in 1969. In this photograph from 1900, you can see the original two upper locks, but notice the railway arches are made of brick. On the next photo from the 1950s, they've been replaced by concrete sections. This is because at Christmas 1940 the Manchester Blitz happened, and the Luftwaffe scored a direct hit on the railway viaduct, causing four arches to collapse on the first night. During rescue work, a further eight arches collapsed, killing a number of rescue workers and their horses. Hume Lock was emptied to remove debris, but you can see in this photograph how the lock was modified in 1962 to combine all three locks. This is the current water level. Huge brick walls were added, along with much larger lock gates. And now, this is how they look today. Let's have a quick look at the River Medlock. This is the last quarter mile of the River Medlock before it flows into the River Irwell. It's very shallow and I have to work hard not to hit any of the underwater obstacles. This is Dawson Street Bridge, which was completely rebuilt in 1992, 
as part of the improvements to the A57 Mancunian Way. This is about as far as I can go without damaging my canoe, but I'll show you where we are. This is a map of Manchester before the Bridgewater Canal arrived, and now, as of 1764, the Medlock was diverted into the Bridgewater Canal. Excess water would flow over a weir here at Castlefield Basin, and back into the original river course. This is how the weir looks today. Here's where I currently am on the River Medlock. Here's the Bridgewater Canal and the Weir. Excess water from the Medlock and the Bridgewater Canal flow over the Weir and down through the smaller portal here on the right. The larger portal on the left is that of the Medlock Diversion. You see with the arrival of the Rochdale Canal flowing into the Bridgewater Canal here, the Board of Trustees decided to remove the heavily polluted River Medlock from their canal. They did this by damming the medlock here. Cutting a long tunnel underneath Castlefield Basin here. The tunnel's construction cost a fortune, but is capable of taking the whole of the river's flow. It now flows out of the portal on the left and back down to where I am on the original medlock river course. Now it's time to turn back to the Irwell. High above us in the distance is the tallest of Manchester's railway viaducts and the plaque on the viaduct reads CLC 1892 which stands for Cheshire Lines Committee. Now we're finally back out onto the River Irwell. Here we see Regent Road Bridge, which looks quite modern but that's because the original bridge was widened in 1989. What's interesting though is that the original stone bridge is still here, sandwiched between the new brick and concrete fascias. Here's a painting of the original bridge in 1929. A 
little further up on Salford Bank is an interesting feature. It's Salford Refuge Basin, built in 1864, so that they could load barges up with rubbish without blocking the main river of the canal. The towpath bridge stands guard over the entrance. But the site has gone through a recent redevelopment in the last 15 years, as you can see here. First the new Manchester Inner Ring Road was built, bridging the river here. The original entrance to the Manchester Bolton and Berry Canal was reinstated, with two new pounds here. These two bridges were removed to make way for the 2017 Ardsall Cord Railway Bridge. Passing under the new road bridge, it's hard to imagine the scene as it was a hundred years ago. Salford Waste Depot occupied the bank here. Christmas 1940, the Luftwaffe struck again. Luckily, no one was hurt this time, but significant damage was done to the depot and the river bank. Now we have an interesting set of bridges coming up. I've made this to help explain them. This is the first one that was built in 1830. Then this one was built in 1849, followed by a cast iron extension bridge built in 1869. But this was removed along with the 1905 Princess Bridge to make way for the 2017 Ardsall Cord Bridge. The stone bridge seen through the arches of the Brick Bridge is known as the Irwell Railway Bridge and was designed by the father of the railways himself, Mr George Stevenson. It carries the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. The bridge, however, was actually an afterthought. You see, the railway was never planning on crossing the Irwell, but in fact stopping on the Salford Bank. This would mean that technically it should have been called the Liverpool and Salford Railway. So as the designers didn't want that, they had to extend the railway over the Irwell and into Manchester. Sadly, the opening of the bridge was marred by an accident in which an overloaded boat struck the coffer dam of the centre pier and overturned, drowning 11 workers. The bridge was opened on the 15th of September 1830, to thunderous applause as the world's first intercity railway was complete. It really is a thing of beauty and a magnificent structure. On the north side is a cast iron pillar which used to support the 1869 extension, however there is talk of them using it as a plinth for a statue of Mr George Stevenson. I for one really hope they do. Now another hidden gem tucked away here on the Salford Bank is the recently restored link to the Manchester Bolton and Berry Canal. The canal was opened in 1796, but was isolated until it finally reached the Irwell here in 1805. This was originally Lock 1. You can still see the indentations where the lock gates used to be in the walls. Although the canal fully closed in 1965, a society was formed in 1987 with the aim of restoring the whole canal over time, and this was their first major milestone. There's a plaque above the tunnel dedicating it to Margaret Fletcher, which opened in 2008.
This is how the tunnel looked during construction. At the far end is the new deep lock, which is actually the third deepest lock in Britain. I do love the way the light looks reflecting at the end of the darkness. Now as I couldn't get through with my canoe, I wanted to show you what it looks like. This is the deep lock. Into the first basin. Then into a second basin. And finally into another lock. lifts it up to where it currently ends. It used to flow through a tunnel and under the railway, but the next mile or so was yet to be excavated. To show you the canal, here's the start at the Irwell. The canal travelled northwestward to a junction where one route went to Bolton and the other one went to Bury. Now only the bits in blue are in water. The green identifies the 60% that is either drained or infilled. The demise of the canal was caused by a major breach here. When in 1936 the bank gave way. With the Irwell below, the canal and the bank collapsed despite previous strengthening attempts shown here. Millions of gallons of water cascaded a hundred feet into the River Irwell, carrying with it hundreds of tons of earth and stone. Even the canal barges were tossed down the valley like a log flume, smashing into pieces at the bottom. Luckily no one was hurt, although it was never repaired. It eventually led to the full closure of the canal. Hopefully the society can put it right one day, and I'll definitely be back to paddle the whole length of it. Here this photograph from 1905 shows a full lock exactly where I am today. The reason it looks so overgrown and unused is this. A sediment bank lies three inches below the water. It was deposited here after the Boxing Day floods of 2015. I have to scrape my canoe to get over it so a narrowboat has no chance. Hopefully a dredger will shift it in the not too distant future. Back out on the Irwell we pass underneath the 2017 Ortel Cord Railway Bridge, which in my opinion is a horrible rust bucket, and a far cry from the beauty of Stevenson's Railway Bridge that it actually casts a shadow over. Moving on, on the right hand side we're coming up on the entrance of the Manchester and Salford Junction Canal. The entrance is marked by this rather pleasant replica of a lift bridge and some disused lock gates. The canal was originally designed so that the Rochdale Canal could reach the Irwell and travel across to the Bolton and Berry Canal and vice versa without having to pay taxes to the Bridgewater Canal to use the Hume lock that we saw earlier. The problem was the Manchester Ship Canal Company formed and bought both the Bridgewater Canal and the Rochdale Canal. So there was no more taxes to pay at Hume Lock, making this canal completely redundant. This is as far as I can go due to a sediment bank that has built up at the entrance, although the canal has been disconnected beyond this lock anyway. On this map from 1848 we are here, and the canal flowed across Manchester to the Rochdale Canal here. In the centre was a 500 yard gas lit tunnel. There were four locks, two at either end, but the predicted traffic never materialised and the canal operated at a loss. However, it did have a slight boost in 1880 when a railway arrived and built the Manchester Central and Great Northern Warehouse 
directly above the canal. A large dock was constructed with two freight lifts installed to transfer goods. Once again, the through traffic never really boomed and it was decided to permanently abandon the canal in 1922. The tunnels found a new lease of life as Manchester Corporation commandeered the tunnels for use as a massive air raid shelter. They drained the water and installed blast walls, creating 16 separate bays, enough to accommodate 1,350 people. And not a minute too soon, the Luftwaffe dropped 500 tonnes of explosive on Manchester and nearly 2,000 incendiary bombs, all at Christmas 1940, resulting in the deaths of 700 people and destroying or severely damaging many buildings. Continuing up the Irwell, we see New Quay Street Bridge. The bridge was built in 1877 and is a bowstring iron bridge. This photo from 1892 shows how busy this area was on the Manchester Bank. So Albert Warehouse and Shed was built to protect cargo from the elements. I think it's one of my favourite structures on the river, as it's the sole survivor of its type and there used to be hundreds of these sheds up and down the river. It's the last true piece of a bygone age, although now it's used as a car park. There is plans to redevelop it without altering the look, but I guess we'll have to see it to believe it. The arches you can see on the left mark the site of Salford Quay, which dates from 1740, when the Irwell was first made navigable. The site was chosen to build Manchester's newest prison here in 1787. Here's the Irwell and here's Salford Quay. The prison reached its full size in 1816 and you can see it here in 1844. However, the prison was superseded by a much larger prison called Strangeways in 1866 resulting in its eventual complete closure two years later. The Riverside Quay, seen here below the main prison building, became New Bailey landing stage and the arches were built to protect cargo and passengers from the elements. The Irwell and Mersey Navigation Company started a regular packet boat service from this quay, which began operation in 1807. Over time, the quay itself became redundant and was chosen as a site of a new pub which opened in 1981. The pub was named after the local hero that I told you about earlier, Mr Mark Addy, and was a very popular watering hole for Salfordians and Mancunians alike. Sadly, everything changed at the end of 2015, when, on Boxing Day, the River Irwell burst its banks and flooded the pub, causing over £200,000 worth of damage. The Mark Addy is still not reopened, and it's likely it never will. Standing next to the Mark Addy is this beautiful bridge, which is actually the second one to cross at this point. The first bridge, seen here, was called New Bailey Bridge and was completed in 1785. However, in 1843 it was found to be in such a state of disrepair it needed to be completely pulled down, and a new bridge replaced it one year later in 1845. And this is the bridge that we see today, now named Albert Bridge. After Albert's Bridge, there's a sudden jump into 21st century architecture. This is Trinity Bridge built in 1995, and the curved building behind it is the 2001 Lowry Hotel. Both the bridge and the hotel are built on the site of DC Thompson & Co Printing, who were responsible for the British comics The Dandy and The Beano. 
After passing the Lowry Hotel, I noticed this outcrop in the wall on the Salford Bank. A sandbank has formed behind it and it turns out to be the corner of the envelope maker's warehouse. But Bros & Co Limited, seen here in this picture, started in 1908 as an envelope maker that now specialises in building construction. It's strange to think that every piece of stone that channels this river has probably got a long history behind it. Speaking of history, our next structure, called Blackfriars Bridge, has a great one. The first bridge that crossed at this point was built by a company of Salford-based comedians who wanted to attract patrons from Manchester to their show. So in 1761 they built a wooden footbridge that stood for 56 years, and here it is in this picture. For reference, my position is marked by a red arrow. It was replaced by a stone arch bridge in 1820. Once again, my position is roughly marked by the red arrow. I've got to admit, it's one of my favourite bridges on the trip, and I love the way the arch frames the cathedral. A parish church was first established on the site in 1215. During the English Civil War in 1649, the church was ransacked. Over the centuries it was rebuilt and expanded upon until 1847 when the church officially became a cathedral. The current finished structure dates from 1882. However the cathedral was devastated during the Christmas Blitz. It took over 20 years to rectify the damage although some sections were never rebuilt. The cathedral was damaged once again in 1992 when a nearby car bomb was detonated by the IRA, injuring 65 people and smashing the cathedral's clock face. However, the cathedral was damaged four years later when the IRA detonated a much more powerful bomb, 750 feet from the cathedral, shattering the stained glass windows. Now you'll notice that there are some pipes coming out of the wall here on the Salford side. I was interested in why these pipes are here and where the water might be coming from. After doing a bit of research, it's apparently something to do with a building called Dial House and a pump outlet for what was once the best kept secret of Manchester, which is hidden 112 feet below ground. During the Cold War, tensions between the West and the East escalated so dramatically that nuclear war looked inevitable. So to prepare for this, NATO began working on 15 secret nuclear bomb shelters in the UK, each capable of surviving a nuclear blast. It was codenamed Scheme 567, but it's now officially known as the Guardian Underground Telephone Exchange. Here's the River Irwell, and this is where the pump outflow is. The tunnel runs for over a mile and a half underneath the city. These photographs show the construction which began in 1953. It was built by Polish miners under complete secrecy. However, three years before the tunnels were completed, Russia tested the hydrogen bomb. The new bomb was so powerful it rendered these tunnels completely obsolete. Knowing that they were now not fit for purpose, NATO signed them over to British Telecom to save them digging up the roads when they wanted to lay new phone cables. Now it's public knowledge that these underground Cold War bunkers under Manchester are here. But honestly, I don't think these pipes are anything to do with it. You see, if you have another look at this picture of the original Blackfriars Bridge from 1761, you can see water flowing out of pipes in the same location as today. Then in this view from Blackfriars Bridge, drawn in 1876, the outlet is once again visible here too, suggesting that some sort of outflow has been here long before the exchange tunnels were built so it's far more likely that the water is actually from a built over spring of some sort. But I guess there's no way of knowing for sure. Now we're coming up on Victoria Bridge and Manchester Cathedral, but before we get there there's a long forgotten landmark hidden beneath the water and silt. 
It is best shown in this illustration from 1753. We are approaching from this direction. The cathedral is represented here. The old Salford Bridge is here, but next to it is the original ford across the river between the two cities. It's where Salford gets its name, meaning the ford by the willow trees. When the river was first made navigable in 1717, the water level was increased with the help of weirs, making it so that the ford was too deep to cross. It would have been around here, however there's no trace left of it today. This stone bridge was built in 1839 and was named in honour of Queen Victoria, although she didn't visit the bridge for another 12 years. It's replaced an earlier three arch bridge which can be seen on the right of this painting and on this map from 1650. Apparently the narrow construction was a hindrance to traffic so it was decided to replace it with a wider single span bridge. Just after Victoria Bridge, on the right, used to be the outflow for what was once a stream known as Hanging Ditch. You see here on this map is the Irwell. This is where we are. This is the River Irk, and this is the original route of Hanging Ditch, which encircled the cathedral like a moat. This was the epicentre of Manchester, as the rivers made it easy to defend from enemy attack. Here is a stone bridge that used to cross Hanging Ditch. This bridge can be seen in this illustration. Here's the Irwell and Hanging Ditch outflow. You'll notice the bridge here as it appeared in 1745 and then the same view today. The bridge dates back from 1421 but as the ditch was backfilled around the 1770s it was forgotten about until the 1880s where it was found and turned into a tourist attraction. You can visit the bridge today and it's been incorporated into part of the Cathedral Visitor Centre. Now if you look at the wall, you'll notice arches that have been bricked up. Hidden within them is an area known as Cathedral Steps, which was turned into an air raid shelter during World War II. We are here underneath Victoria Bridge, and in red are the seven entrances that lead into the air raid shelter. There is a main corridor that runs behind the arches. The arches are closed to the public, but luckily some urban explorers have taken photographs to show us what it's like down there. Then there's 13 arches that have been converted into shelters with blast proof partitions. Two arches are dedicated to electrical generators and the warden's office and air supply are over here. The large public toilets were here and these remained in use after the arches were closed to the public. Now there is currently talk of redeveloping the arches with a new entrance being opened next to the cathedral. The plans have included waterfront shops and cafes protruding out of the wall. but it'll have to be a very strong glass as we remember what happened to a similar design in 2015. Now before the arches, the riverside used to slope down from the cathedral and a number of shops and dwellings were built right here on the riverbank. To level out the land in front of the cathedral, the buildings were knocked down and arches were used to support a new road which was built in 1838. The arches were utilised by merchants and industrial manufacturers. But due to the pollutants these manufacturers were dumping into the river, it was decided to close them down. In addition, a couple of wooden passenger landings were created where tourists and locals alike would take pleasure cruises down the Irwell. However, the passenger landings, while popular, were closed after flooding of the Irwell repeatedly damaged them. Mm -hmm. 
This is Palatine Road Bridge. It's a wrought iron bridge originally built in 1864. It was rebuilt and widened 47 years later in 1911. On the Manchester side, where the bridge connects to the bank, there was quite a bad landslide in 1939. The constant erosion of the Irwell caused the retaining wall to collapse, and with it the pavement and road fell into the river. Two girls were waiting for the bus when the ground gave way beneath them. Luckily, a lad was able to rescue the girls by climbing down a collapsed lamppost. If you look at the wall today, you can see where the collapse happened, as the repaired section is now made out of blue brick, as opposed to the original material. In this painting from 1867, you can see the original was made out of stone. The drain outflow is still in the same place as it is today. Now we're coming up to the end of the River Irk, which flows out of the tunnel and into the Irwell. On this map from 1825, we are here. Here's the Irwell, and here's the River Irk. Victoria Station was originally opened on the 1st of January 1844, with one large centre platform for passengers. However, the station hugely expanded to no less than 17 platforms in 1904. In order to do this, the last half a mile of the River Irk was fully covered over. Now, I haven't brought a torch with me today, but we'll have a little look inside. Just inside the entrance is this massive pipe, which actually carries one of Manchester's main sewers across the river. It is known as the G Interceptor, and was built in 1889. It also has a robust iron casing to help protect it from the river in flood. Now this is pretty cool. This is the original bridge across the river here at Hunt's Bank. You can see it in this illustration. With the Irwell here and the Irk outflow here, you can clearly see a bridge across the river here. It's also on this map from 1825 are more clearly shown in this picture from 1797. Now I'm not joking you, the camera is picking up a lot more than I can see. It was pretty much pitch black here so I didn't dare go much further. What is interesting though, is in this picture from 1797, you can see the original lane which leads down to Hunt's Bank. It was also culverted over when they raised the street level in 1838. So the lane is still there, and this is the only picture I can find of it. Now it truly is pitch black. It's creepy to imagine children playing here in this river, like they are in this painting in 1831. It's hard to believe that I'm just underneath the bridge here where the red arrow is. Well, it's dark enough for me, so I'm heading back to the Irwell. Next time I'll definitely bring a torch.
I really like the stonework supporting the original Manchester to Leeds railway. As seen in this engraving from the 19th century. Now there's some magnificent arches and they are all built to carry various railways across the Irwell. On this picture from 1948 you can see the Irwell. Highlighted red is Manchester Victoria and in green is Manchester Exchange Station which has now been demolished but they used to be joined by the longest platform in Europe at 2,238 feet long. One of the arches that I'm currently under even had a locomotive turntable on it. They definitely have a feeling of grandeur, that's for sure. Framed rather nicely on the right is Manchester's Parcels Office. It's now been converted into apartments. Here on the Salford side, there's been a series of unfortunate events. Frankenberg and Sons rubber mill used to stand on the site. During World War I, it was used to create mustard gas for the trenches, but a fire broke out and a major incident was only just avoided, thanks to the quick response from the fire crews. During the explosion, barrels of toxic gas were sent skyward, and one even landed in the River Irwell, adding to the terrible pollution. Then, after it was rebuilt and turned back into a rubber factory, the Luftwaffe scored yet another direct hit during the Christmas Blitz. This time the mill was not fully rebuilt and you can still see the damage on this picture from eight years later. Now when I was planning this trip I saw these shapes on Google Earth that look quite interesting. I wanted to at least reach this point so that I could investigate them and see if they were in fact sunken narrowboats like this one. But they turned out to be huge stone blocks. I had no idea where they've come from or why they're here. So I decided to explore their origins. We are here on this bend in the river. Until quite recently the river used to meander a lot more and used to be known as the Anaconda as it was thought to be quite snake like. But the severe twists in the river resulted in a lot of flooding so engineers created a bypass in the 1960s. This is now known as the Anaconda Cut. When it was built, the majority of this mill had to be knocked down. Here's the river and here's Greengate Mill with the new cut behind it. When the mill was demolished, large stone blocks were thrown into the river to help reduce erosion on the banks. 
2014, the blocks were being repositioned when it was noticed that some had letters engraved on them, so these blocks were removed and put on display on the riverbank. Now, this is as far as I'm paddling today, as the river gets quite shallow from here onwards. But I thought to finish, I'd mention some of the future plans for the river. There's a proposal in the works to turn the river into an urban park and recreational space. It's estimated to cost around £75 million, and the plans include six new bridges, as well as the redevelopment of 34 acres along the river bank. One thing's for sure, the River Irwell has seen a lot of change in the past, and I'm sure there'll be a lot more in the future too. That's it for today. Thank you for coming with me on this journey up the River Irwell. I hope you've enjoyed it and found it interesting. Until next time, Keep on living the dream.